afternoon, I'm Siobhan McCusker, the museum educator for the university audience here at the Blanton Museum of Art at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome to our Mellon Fellows celebration. This afternoon, we're delighted to welcome our three curatorial Mellon Fellows, Christine Zepeda, Asia Mujinga, and Lucy Casada, who are going to share with us their special curatorial projects that they've worked on over the course of their fellowship. Welcome, Christine, Asia, and Lucy. If you wouldn't mind just unmuting and saying hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, all. Hello, thank you so much. Um, and just a few notes before we begin. Your audio is muted, so no one can hear you, and only the panelists are visible on the screen. Closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking your questions from the Q&A window. Just click the icon below to type and send your questions. I'll be monitoring those. Feel free to make comments in the chat window, but please ask your questions through the Q&A box. Um, and today's event is being recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube page roughly two weeks from today. Um, now let's get started. Um, and I'm going to begin by uh, sharing a little of um, Christine's wonderful accomplishments. Christine Zepeda will be presenting first. And Christine is the Andrew Mellon Fellow in Prints and Drawings and a doctoral candidate in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Texas at Austin. Advised by Dr. Joan Holliday and Dr. Jeffrey Smith, her doctoral research re-examines court art, material culture, and elite architectural spaces from the perspective of royal women in medieval England. Her dissertation entitled, Royal Women's Visual and Other Century Cultures in Plantagenet England, 1236 to 1409, employs the principles of anthropology, aesthetic phenomeno phenomenology, and sensory theory to create individualized sensory models and reception scenarios for England's Plantagenet queens with the aim of recovering the ways in which these women would have perceived, interpreted, and interfaced with the material environments. Christine holds a BA in history with a minor in philosophy from the University of North Texas, an MA in medieval studies from Fordham University, and an MS in information studies from the University of Texas at Austin and an MA in the History of Art from the University of Texas at Austin. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Christine. Thank you for sharing your project with us. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for that introduction. Um, as Siobhan said, my name is Christine Zapeda, and I am this year's Mellon Fellow in Prints and Drawings at the Blanton. Um, I specialize in medieval European art of the 13th and 14th centuries. Now, you might be wondering in what someone who studies high medieval art is doing with a fellowship that focuses on a medium, prints, that wasn't popular until the 15th century, close to the end of the medieval period. Well, in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you. Um, while the Middle Ages may have ended with the European-wide flowering of the Renaissance in the 15th century, the afterlife of the Middle Ages has persisted until the present day. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you take note, you'll see that what we call medievalisms are a very common feature of modern pop culture as the popularity of TV shows like Game of Thrones and movies like Monty Python and the Holy Grail attest. And medievalisms, a term which refers to the art, literature, scholarship, avocational pastimes, and sundry forms of entertainment and culture that turn to the Middle Ages for their subject matter or inspiration have actually existed since the Renaissance when humanist scholars coined the term Middle Ages in order to define the period as a transitional period between the glory of the classical world and their own time, which they saw as reviving that ancient legacy. So when I began this fellowship, I was keen to gain experience in one of the curator's main functions, exhibit curation. But I wondered how that would be possible using a collection that contains relatively few medieval objects. So when Holly Borum, my fellowship mentor and the associate curator of prints, drawings and European art approached me proposing that I put together an exhibition 
on the topic of medievalisms, I saw that it would indeed be possible to tell the story of the Middle Ages to the Blanton's patrons, just not exactly in the way I'd first envisioned. As this slide shows, medievalism studies is in fact a thriving subdiscipline within medieval studies that has gained a tremendous amount of traction in the past few decades. Conferences devoted to the topic of medievalisms are now almost ubiquitous, with scholars presenting on topics as wide ranging as J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, uh, to the ways in which white supremacists and other radical groups use supposed medieval values to support their, support their ideologies. The appearance of professional societies, monographs, and of course, a dedicated scholarly journal devoted to medievalism studies further attest to the thriving nature of this field. Medievalism studies had not, to this point, been something which I'd specialized, but it always been one of those things that sort of floated on the periphery of all of my scholarly endeavors an ever-present item on my things to look into list. So curating this exhibition has actually given me a chance to finally learn more about this intriguing topic and has shown me that from medieval and Renaissance fairs to the latest Hollywood film about King Arthur, the Middle Ages are still alive and well in contemporary culture. So the first step in curating this exhibition was the rather daunting task of seeing what there was in the collection that could be leveraged. One of the first that, yeah, and there it is, the collection. <laughs> One of the first things that I learned from Holly is that you can't tell a story with objects that you just don't have. So to some extent, you have to allow the objects in your collection to help shape your vision. So I spent countless hours searching every term I could think of in our online database, um, spending time um, pulling prints and setting them aside for consideration. There was so much stacking that occurred. Um, and losing myself going through uh, the, our books and uh, boxes of prints in the print storage area, which you see on this slide. Um, on the next slide, you can see, I even created miniature colored printouts of all of the objects that I was considering and spread them over every flat surface available, um, even the floor. <laughs> so that I could more easily visualize how they might fit together. Um, and it turned out that we had more than enough material to fill the three rooms of the paper vault galleries, uh, which is always something to be grateful for when putting together an exhibition. But the volume and the wide temporal range of the materials left me with the question, how am I going to put these objects together in a way that makes sense and tells a story? That is me wondering how, um, because the topic of medievalism isn't confined by temporal or geographic boundaries and isn't something that's confined to a specific group of artists or characteristic of any particular style. The task of organizing this exhibition into something comprehensible was daunting. And I'll admit that at times I thought it would be impossible, but I continued to just forge ahead, searching for new objects, familiarizing myself with our holdings, and waiting for that aha moment that I hoped so fervently would come. Uh, and sometimes I just had to put my head down on my desk and remind myself that the moment would get there. So this is where the collaborative nature of curation um, really proved to be the most valuable. Um, I've lost count of the number of times that Holly, Rachel, the, curas the curatorial assistant in prints and drawings, and I pulled out all of the prints under consideration and arranged them in the print study room, um, as you see on this slide, and spent several hours moving them around, discussing possible themes and groupings, whittling down what we call our no thank yous, because we like to be polite to the prints, and identifying the potential standout objects as I furiously took notes on my phone, an example of which you can see on this slide. So which e with each of these collaborative discussions, um, we inched slowly towards discovering that elusive organizing principle that would make everything magically fall into place. After one particularly intense brainstorming session, things finally started to come together. We realized that we were really telling several stories and answering several questions at once, simultaneously because of the breadth of our materials. So while our objects were the product of several different um, artistic styles and movements. Most of them came from specific and fairly well-studied periods of medieval revival in the 19th and 20th centuries. This thus became one of our organizing principles and allowed us to um, bound the exhibition temporally. We also decided right off the bat, we needed to show our audience what the Middle Ages looked like in terms of artistic style to give them a way to orient themselves visually in the remainder of the exhibition. So you can see on the next slide, um, the first room, 
we, oh, can we go one more, please, Neil? Thank you. So um, the first room we decided was going to be devoted to the medieval aesthetic. Um, so in this gallery, representat representative medieval objects are paired with modern reinterpretations of some of the quintessential motifs and media of medieval art to illuminate the medieval aesthetic. The style changed over the course of the Middle Ages. There are some characteristics that we can point to that are definitively medieval, including a diminished emphasis on naturalism, flattened space and figures, linearity and abstraction, a lack of interest in perspective, jewel-like colors and the frequent use of gold and silver, elaborate ornamentation, and of course, Christian themes and iconography. The objects in the first gallery exemplify many of these themes and demonstrate the ways in which modern artists have revived and adapted them in their own works. So this gallery has four groupings. Um, the first grouping, which you'll see on the next slide, is a series of crucifixion images. So on this slide, uh, the two objects on the left represent our medieval examples. We have a, a woodcut from the 15th century tract entitled The Spiritual Interpretation of the Life of Christ, which was produced around the year 1485 in the workshop of Michael Vogelmutt in Nuremberg. And the second object is a hand-colored woodcut on vellum depicting Christ on the cross flanked by the Virgin and St. John, also created sometime in the late 15th century. So these two objects exemplify some of the visual features that are typical of medieval art that were leveraged by the later artists in this grouping, including the bold linearity of woodcut, a lack of perspective and flattened space, and an emphasis on abstraction rather than naturalism. Uh, next slide, please. The second grouping juxtaposes a medieval virgin and child dating from the 15th century, the beginning of the 15th century, with Ellsworth Kelly's mother and child, which he created in 1949. So Kelly, who had a lifelong fascination with medieval art and architecture, here presents us with a composition that I think really encapsulates the essence of this popular medieval iconography with beautiful simplicity, again, focusing on archetypally medieval visual traits such as abstraction and flattened perspective. On the next side, you can see the third grouping in this gallery, which pairs a medieval liturgical object, which is the object on the right, uh, with a piece of late medieval stained glass and a 20th century architectural print. So here our goal is to give viewers an idea of the visual vocabulary of sacred spaces in the, in the Middle Ages. So the cathedral depicted by John Taylor Arms in the print on the left um, in the 20th century, as it stood in, in the Middle Ages would have contained the jewel-like stained glass and highly ornamented silver liturgical furnishings next to which it's being presented in this exhibition. In the next slide, uh, you'll see the final grouping in this gallery, which explores the aesthetics of the medieval book. Um, medieval book design has really defined the appearance of the printed page until modern times. And the works in this grouping place three medieval examples, two books of hours and a page from a missal alongside Kelmscott Press's magnificent edition of the works of, Ch of Chaucer and Felix Buo's symphonic margins to illustrate how later artists drew inspiration from the medieval book arts. Um, next slide. Um, once viewers have been familiarized with the medieval aesthetic and gotten a glimpse of how later artists were inspired by it, the second gallery will introduce the various forms of 19th and 20th century medievalisms. During this period, uh, some artists were inspired by contact with the wealth, architectural and material remains of the period to preserve and memorialize these medieval objects for posterity, while others capitalized creatively on popular or quasi-historical beliefs about what constituted the medieval to create new works that expressed themselves primarily by reinterpreting medieval ideas and ideals rather than imitating medieval aesthetic forms. The objects in the second gallery are examples of these two types of medievalisms. The first group of works in this gallery illustrate the ways in which modern artists have revived medieval saints and luminaries as models for social commentary during times of social or political upheaval. On this slide, you can see one example um, of the groupings in this gallery, uh, uh, Dante, who wrote his divine comedy in the vernacular rather than Latin, and is often therefore considered the father of Italian literature and an important figure in the birth of early modern culture. 
On the next slide, you can see another example. Um, here we have Joan of Arc, the medieval warrior saint who saved France during the Hundred Years' War. And she is taken as a subject um, by Anna Hyatt Huntington in the sculpture on the left, who created the sculpture during a time when women artists were still marginalized and underappreciated. And Lovis Corinth, who used the figure of this female saint to make a political statement in the aftermath of World War I. The remaining objects in this gallery manifest the antiquarian and documentary impulse of the 19th century that drove artists to record in really magnificent detail, both architectural remains and material objects from the Middle Ages as a way of preserving and claiming the romantic legacy of this period for themselves. As you can see on this slide, perhaps one of the most prolific, um, can, oh, <laughs> thanks Neil, uh, one of the most prolific of such antiquarians was the English artist, John Sell Cotman. So this gallery features a series of four of the etchings he made for his volume entitled, A Series of Etchings Illustrative of the Architectural Antiquities of Norfolk and demonstrate the close attention to detail and emphasis on faithful reproduction that were key features of such documentary prints. The documentary impulse behind the Gothic revival had links to contemporary social issues as well, such as national identity, industrialization, religious controversy, and the preservation of national monuments. A fascinating series of objects that also represent this documentary impulse and are also some of my favorite objects in the exhibition were a lucky discovery that I made entirely by accident. Um, I decided to search our database for the word triptych, um, which is a term for a popular type of altarpiece in the Middle Ages. And among the results was this really fantastic uh, prints by the artist Jules Ferdinand Jacquemart of a 12th century German triptych. So this led me to wonder whether this artist had produced any other prints of medieval objects. And upon searching his name in our database, I discovered these two gems, which you'll see on the next slide, which are some of my very favorites, um, which after further research I discovered were part of a volume documenting uh, the gems and crown jewels in the Louvre Museum um, in a volume dating from 1865. Um, another accidental find made uh, a little bit later in the game uh, included these two objects. Um, so I was actually just poking around in print storage, uh, looking through our collection of books um, that, that we received from William Ivins, who was an art historian and founder of the print department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And I came across two volumes that looked promising and then proceeded to spend the next hour, maybe two, uh, excitedly leafing through the hundred or so prints of medieval enamels ivory sculptures and liturgical objects that were documented in these two volumes. A little bit of further research revealed that these volumes were created to document the medieval art collection purchased from French designer and collector George Henschel by J. Pierpont Morgan in 1906, when he was president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I love these so much, if I could, I would fill an entire room of the paper vault with them. But since I can't, I selected these two objects as representative of important medieval forms. Uh, on the left, a cross, and on the right, a reliquary. These objects, along with the other documentary prints in this gallery, show the enormous interest in the medieval past that existed both in America and Europe during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The final gallery, which you'll see on the next slide, continues to explore the ways in which artists adapted, reinterpreted, revived, and reimagined common medieval visual motifs and themes, beginning with the arts and crafts movement that arose in the second half of the 19th century and ending with the contemporary uh, work of American artist Ellsworth Kelly. The works displayed here represent important historical moments during which artists look back to an idealized Middle Ages that they thought to represent a time that was better or at least worthy of being emulated. Um, next slide, please. Another of my favorite objects in this exhibition is this Gothic revival armchair, which you'll see on this slide, which was a product of the arts and crafts movement that was begun by William Morris. In the exhibition, we've paired it with an antiquarian print by John Taylor Arms and a spectacular etching by Eugène Napoleon Neureuther of the Sleeping Beauty after brother, the Brothers Grimm, which he made in 1836 for the members of the Kunstvereinigung. The inspiration from Gothic architecture is really clear in the way that the shape of the chair and the architectural framework of the Sleeping Beauty scene 
mimics the popular triangular gables of Gothic architecture as shown in arms prints. Um, on the next side, you'll see the closing of the exhibition uh, with the works of Ellsworth Kelly. Uh, next slide, please, Neil. Kelly had a lifelong fascination with medieval art, which he studied firsthand in Europe, primarily France, both as a soldier during World War II and afterwards as an art student in Paris. These works exemplify the way in which a personal fascination with the Middle Ages can manifest over time in the career of a single artist. From Kelly's initial fascination with the Middle Ages shown in his sketches of medieval manuscripts to the inspiration that Kelly took from the stained glass of Chart Cathedral when designing his only architectural work, Austin, which is here at the Blanton. Next slide. Um, so I've learned a great deal during the process of putting together this exhibition. And in closing, I'd like to share a few of what I've taken to be the most important lessons. Um, first, curating is hard. <laughs> I never thought that it wasn't hard, but it is harder than I imagined. Um, it's one thing to be a, a scholar um, and to be able to call on any piece of artwork you desire to tell a story or make a point, and quite another to have to tell that same story with just, just the objects in your museum's collection. It takes an enormous amount of creativity and critical thinking, not to mention research, to make the connections between pieces that make a show meaningful for your audience. Second, I've learned that every exhibition develops differently and at its own pace. I've worked on two exhibitions while a fellow at the Blanton, and the trajectory and approach and the structure of these two shows was so divergent that my experience working on the first one could not have fully prepared me for my experience on the second. And I think that's part of the fun and challenge of curation. Finally, I learned that unlike writing and publishing academic papers, exhibit curation is overwhelmingly collaborative. While as PhD students, we work on our magnum opus in the form of our dissertation, it's designed to represent us as individual scholars. An exhibition is the product of an entire team of people and I think that makes for an incredibly rich store of talent, expertise, and perspectives to draw on. Whether I go into museum curation or pursue another path after graduation, I have no doubt that my experience here at the Bland as a Mellon Fellow will prove to have prepared me well for what comes next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. I so appreciated your journey and how you demystified your curatorial process and Creating an exhibition from artworks in our collection presents its own set of challenges and joys for sure. Um, and thank you for kind of synthesizing your learning moments at the end that really tickled me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sure. Our next Mellon Fellow is Asia Mujinga. And um, Asia is the Andrew Mellon Fellow in Modern and Contemporary Art and a doctoral student in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research interests concentrate on queer, feminist, and hybrid visualizations of selfhood across the Black Atlantic, as well as the ways anti-colonial practices from the African diaspora and indigenous Americas echo and complicate one another. I'm sorry, um, Asia, I'm, I didn't switch out your name, so let me just do that mentally in my head. Mujinga received her BA from Sarah Lawrence uh, College and completed both an MA and an MFA from the University of Montana, where she focused on conceptual art and problems of Eurocentrism embedded in the art historical pedagogy. She is beginning her dissertation research under the supervision of Dr. Cherise Smith. Between graduate programs, Mujinga spent three years as, as an assistant professor of studio art and art history at the University of Montana Western, where she managed exhibitions of the permanent collection and produced the program of visiting contemporary exhibitions as the university's gallery coordinator. She has worked with Tippett Rise Art Center in Montana, the Headland Center for the Arts in California, and all three integrations of the Race and Poetics Conference, Thinking Its Presence. Thanks, Asia.
Thank you so much. Um, the name confusion there is due to an emerging name change, but more on that later. Um, thank you so much, for Christine. It was so wonderful to learn more about your work. I know that we've encountered each other a number of times, but this is a deeper dive into your work than I've had before and enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, thank you so much, Siobhan and Neil, for all of your hard work pulling this together. Um, and I'm especially grateful to the Blanton for this opportunity to become part of the team for this year. Um, it's been such an enormous privilege. So as a fellow in modern contemporary art, I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with Veronica Roberts. Um, when I first interviewed for the position, I told her that some of my particularly interests were to sharpen my professional writing skills and really get involved with production of exhibition catalogs, as well as as a modern and contemporary curator, work directly with some of the artists whose work were um, exhibiting. So with her support, I was able to design a final project in multiple stages that allowed me to do all of those things. Um, I did a special project in three parts. I researched and wrote an essay on Emma Amos for inclusion in the exhibition catalog for Assembly, New Acquisitions by Contemporary Black Artists, which has been open this past uh, academic year. Um, I conducted an artist interview for a series of recordings that will be published alongside the Day Jobs exhibition, and I will be editing an artist essay for inclusion in the Day Jobs exhibition catalog. Today, my talk will uh, mostly focus on the uh, Emma Amos paper that I put together. This essay was written to contextualize the 1983 piece Hits, which the Blanton recently acquired in conjunction uh, with the exhibition assembly and which has been on the view with assembly for this past academic year. Until 1983, the majority of Emma Amos's figures were seated or still forms within which Amos could experiment with color, representation, and composition. The strength of these figures communicated through their, del their, their deliberate posture and the gaze that they returned to their viewers. Then, just as the United States was preparing to host the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, something shifted in Amos's work. Watching sports competitions on television awakened Amos's interest in movement. And her work was suddenly populated with bodies in motion, running and diving and jumping and leaping and flying and falling. In a 1995 discussion at Art Table, Amos described this transition in terms of gender, saying, I switched from my seated women of the 1970s and 80s to paintings of male athletes because I wanted to steal male power, a theme I've continued into my recent paintings. The work from this period makes clear, however, that Amos's conception of male power was more nuanced than her quote let on, especially when it came to Black men. Discussing pieces like 22 and Cheetah that paired the figures of athletes with images of wild animals, Amos spoke of the prowess, ferocity, steadfastness, and dynamism that these athletes shared with their animal counterparts, as well as the way in which we abuse and hate them in almost the same way. In using the figure of the athlete to approach her fascination with absolute movement, Amos also explored the complexity of that movement as both fugitive and liberating. In the 1983 painting, Hits, the sense of movement is visible not only in the animated posture of the two running figures or in the energy of the black and white stripes that streak across their bodies, but also the way in which these figures are fragmented and incomplete. An arm, a hand, or a foot dissolves into a background or into unraveled threads. This fragmentation invites us to see the figures as blurred from the speed at which they fly past, while also alluding to ideas of violence and injury. Recognizing Amos's concern for Black athletes in 22 and Cheetah, we may look for these same themes to determine the meaning of hits as well. However, presuming that the silhouettes and hits are Black figures risks pressing Amos's work into a representational corner that she resented and often criticized. In the catalog for the exhibition Looking Forward, Looking Black in 1999, she was quoted in saying, in the mid 80s, I noticed that curators from public institutions mostly chose to exhibit paintings of mine showing figures that could be identified as black. Every African American artist, including those whose work is more abstract or who do not paint recognizably black figures, has confronted curatorial and editorial definitions of black art that perpetuate the segregation of images and artists. Pushing back against this bias, Amos claimed that she became, and I quote, became more interested and determined to use a multicolored mix of skin tones, end quote. 
According to her, across her figurative work, Amos treated skin tones as malleable, manipulating them for both formal and political effect. When using her own body as a model, which she often did, she might render her skin anywhere between, and I quote again, butterscotch, brown, or really black. In some works, such as Clouds of Joy and All I Know of Wonder, Amos uses multiple skin tones in the composition of a single body. In All I Know of Wonder, a white arm tucks behind a brown hip from which a dark brown leg is held askance. Although both she and scholars of her work have linked her tendency to treat its skin tone is fluid within her paintings to her multiracial background, Lisa Farrington's identification of Amos as a formalist, or more specifically as a colorist, seems equally relevant to this approach. The influence of abstract and neo-expressionism in her early work, first when she was a student and current encountering de Kooning, Barnett Newman, and Jackson Pollock at a 1959 exhibition at the Tate, and then through her close and influential friendship with Norman Lewis after 1963. Um, uh, these influences manifested in Amos's strong sense of color, composition, gesture, and design, a sense that the political readings of her choices often frustrated. Amos said, every time I think about color, it's a political statement. It would be a luxury to be white and never think about it. We're always talking about color, but colors are also skin colors, and the term colored itself all means something else to me end quote. Keenly aware of the politics of each shade of brown that she might deploy, Amos manipulated and refuted the oversignification of these politics and their attachment to fixed signs, often refusing to present coherently Black figures across her body of work. Looking closely at hits, we can see traces of Amos's tonal flu fluidity. Along the contours of the left figure's elbow, we can identify multiple overlapping shades, from the peach pink we might associate with Caucasian flesh through a range of brown tones, and finally, in the figure's upper arm, a bold stroke of ink black. With only these multivalent swatches, silhouettes, and our presumptions about Amos as an artist to read from, whether we understand these figures as black, white, or any race at all is really left to the viewer. Beyond these enigmatic swatches of pink, brown, and black, though, Amos's masterful sense of color is also recognizable in subtle details of hits. Even in this comparatively subtle work, Amos's comfort with color and design is recognizable in the bold orange tones of the handwoven fabric at the top of the composition, which runs down along the raw canvas edges on either side before finally being picked up by the boldest ribbon of orange and green dangling among the frayed swatches of the fabric along the bottom border. The blush of yellow and orange tinting the fabric from which the figure on the right is cut and the slash of red extending a single bright thread's color into the background um, echo the bold orange in her framing and warm and unify the piece. In the background, the expressive wash of warm whites and grays in the otherwise raw canvas demonstrate Amos's gestural sensibility and illustrates Lisa Farrington's observation that, and I quote, Amos finds inertia corrosive in her work and goes to great lengths to eliminate all that is static. She employs even energized brush strokes to render concrete the very atmosphere that envelops her figures, not even the air in her compositions stationary. More than her skill with color, however, it is Amos's remarkable fusion of textile and painting that stands out most strongly in hits. Using swatches of fabric, Amos wove herself as a surface elements to build her composition. Amos enriches her bold sense of design with the materiality of these textiles. The subtlety with variations in thickness, texture, color, and tone move through the fabric's warp and weft and add to the work's complexity. When seen in person, the shimmer and glint of metallic thread in the weave add another layer of life and movement to these running figures. The introduction of textile elements to her paintings is significant in the way that it collapses the distinction between fine art mediums of paint on canvas and the craft of weaving. Treating linen canvas, woven textile scraps, and paper as synonymous iterations of woven fabrics dismantled these existing hierarchies. In a 2011 interview with Patricia Spears Jones, Amos explained that to her, the canvas is a textile. In fact, for a period of time, Amos actually referred to as idiotic, she hand wove her own canvases on which to paint. 
Although that particular experiment was short-lived, she continued to amplify the textile materiality of her canvases by presenting them as free floating and unstretched, in addition to incorporating handwoven sample and sampled fabrics into her composition. When sampling fabrics, Amos reached for African and African coated fabrics such as Dutch wax, Kente cloth, Kanga cloth, Bobo Lafini textiles, um, and other sampled uh, textiles that linked her interest in uh, textile work, color work, and the diffused pan Africanist heritage of African Americans. Um, Amos's ability to dissolve the distinctions between cloth, canvas, and paper stems from her expertise as a professional weaver. First taking courses at Antioch and then London, Amos found work with the famous textile designer Dorothy Leeds, um, who we can see watching her weave in the black and white photo here. Um, hired on the strength of her design skills, as demonstrated by color etchings that she brought to her interview, Amos went on to design major projects through the Big Low Sanford Rug, Rug Company from 1961 to 1969, including upholstery, blinds, dress fabrics, and custom rugs, such as a 40-foot rug installed at the London, London Hilton, of which I've not been able to find the photograph. Uh, while employed with Dorothy Leeds, Amos got one day off a week to make art and to work towards the completion of another art degree at NYU. When her second child, her daughter India, was born, Amos refocused her attention to weaving and taught classes at Greenwich Village Thread Shop called Threadbear, using her own collection of looms, of which she had eight. Four years later, she would take a position teaching art and weaving at the New York School of Fine and Industrial Arts. At first, Amos kept her professional craft-based work and fine arts practice quite separate. In an interview with Bell Hooks, Amos told her, and I quote, well, I certainly knew not to admit that I was a weaver because people held it against me. It was just a smart thing to keep your mouth shut and not admit it. Between 1972 and 1978, however, feminist artists pushed back against the stigma imposed on women's work and embraced influences of textile arts in their work, creating what would be called the pattern decoration movement. The same year that Joyce Kozloff and Miriam Shapiro established the feminist art program at Cal Arts, Emma Amos pitched an idea for a craft skills centered television program to the American Crafts Council. It was six years later in 1977 that the Boston television studio WGBH paired Amos and a quilter novelist named Beth Gutcherson to produce the program entitled Show of Hands. And you can see her on the set of Show of Hands in this image here. Based in Boston, the show featured woodworkers, ceramicists, weavers, quilters, jewelers, and stained glass makers, building on Amos's premise that any artist could learn to use some other kind of art. Although the show ended in 1978 after only 13 episodes, the free exchange of specialized creative skills and the blurring distinctions between fine art and craft empowered Amos to bridge her creative and professional practices and materials. Despite her concern that being a weaver would result in her dismissal from the series art world, Emma Amos was a central player in several major art scenes. At the age of 22, she was invited to be the only female member of an important Black artist collective, alongside Romero Bearden, Norman Lewis, Hale Woodruff, Charles Alston, Merton Simpson, and others. The group, called Spiral, was formed in 1963 after its founding members marched on Washington and heard Martin Luther King deliver his famous I Have a Dream speech. They gathered to debate the concept of negritude and developed in, um, in the post-colonial writings of Franz Fanon and Leopold Sidaf Senghor. Um, they debated whether there was such a thing as a singular Black aesthetic essence, to which Amos replied an emphatic no, according to her own interviews, and to criti critique each other's work and to exhibit their uh, work in group shows. So it was a very radical and energized group of artists. In later interviews, Amos remembered Romara Bearden, who she called Romy, as, and Norman Lewis and Hale Woodruff with fondness, though not without taking them to task for failing to invite their Black women contemporaries, including Faith Ringgold and Vivian Brown, to the group. Recalling her invitation to join the group, Amos told Courtney Martin in an interview, the question is, why did they invite me? As a feminist, I knew then that something was up. Why would you invite a 22-year-old to join a group like that? I was not threatening to them, or so they thought. And she's uh, later spoken about the fact that she decided to be quite threatening and to yell along with them whenever given the opportunity um, and to be very explicit and forward in her statements and not subservient in the slightest. 
Um, perhaps in response to this underestimation masquerading as special treatment, Amos would eventually join forces with feminist um, artists and scholars, Lucy Lepard, Vivian Brown, Joyce Kosloff, Faith Ringgold, and Mary Stevens to produce the journal Heresies, a feminist publication on arts and politics. Towards the end of her life, it was revealed that Amos had also been a member of the famous anonymous feminist artist collective, the Guerrilla Girls, whom Amos referred to as a very famous clandestine women's group that did not ever go out without masks on our faces. Um, alongside this important group of women doing mischief, as she characterized them, Amos traveled internationally, building women's art movements in Europe. Presumably, she also participated in a number of protests, demonstrations, and publications at home as well. Whether in the midst of Black and feminist art activism, her bold dissolution of the boundaries between fine art and craft, her defiantly fluid treatment of skin color and color, or through the complex ways in which she set bodies in motion, Emma Amos was a forceful and impactful presence. She knew the spaces she occupied were charged with meaning, famously stating, for me, a Black woman artist, to walk into the studio is a political act. Writing for the exhibition catalog of Amos's retrospective at the Georgia Museum of Art, the artist and Amos's friend Kay Walkingstick acknowledged that even if the subjects of Amos' paintings were less than jubilant, Amos's artistic voice acts as a balance to return us to joy, pure joy. Um, Emma Amos died in 2020 after an accomplished career. Um, so although I conducted my research into Amos, Amos's work by standing in front of her work, by reading critical pieces, and by reading interviews through which her humor and her curiosity and her strength of character were definitely palpable, I did not get a chance to meet her. However, through the day job's recordings, I did get a chance to meet interview the remarkable artist Nate Lewis. You'll recognize this piece, um, which will be coming up in the next slide, if you see the exhibition next year. Like many of Lewis's works, uh, Signaling 23 cuts patterns into the surface of a photograph, performing a kind of diagnostic act into the questions of the body, the self, and the notion of a social skin that is inspired by his many years as a nurse in intensive care. We spoke about this and much more in our virtual face-to-face -face recording session for which I am currently recording the transcript. Finally, I'll also get a chance to participate in the production of the Day Jobs exhibition catalog when I review an essay by the artist Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, whose work I'm excited to learn so much more about. And you can catch a glimpse of him and his really compelling work here um, in this last slide before I say thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Asia. It, um, it's so extraordinary to hear your research and I love personally teaching with HITS and now I just like know a lot more information that is um, kind of expanding my understanding of that work. So thank you. And it's so beautiful to hear it in your voice. Um, our final Mellon Fellow to present is um, Lucy, Lucy Casada. And um, Lucy is the Andrew Mellon Fellow in Latin American Art and a doctoral student in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Texas at Austin and is sponsored by the National Research and Development Agency of Chile and the Fulbright Program. Her research centers on contemporary Latin American art with an emphasis on the relationships between art and politics in the Southern Cone. Her doctoral research advised by Dr. Adele Nelson explores the official field of visual art during the military dictatorships of Argentina, Brazil and Chile between the 1960s and the 1980s. Casada received her BA and her MA from the Universidad de Chile. Her previous research pro projects focused on cultural institutions from the early 1970s in Chile, such as Museo de la Solidaridad and the Instituto de Arte Latinoamericano. Thanks, Lucy, hang handing it over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Siobhan, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you also to uh, all the audience here that is here to celebrate with us today. Uh, so as uh, Siobhan was saying, I'm the Mellon Fellow in Latin American Art, working with the wonderful Latin American Art curatorial team composed by Vanessa Davidson, uh, Florencia Bassano, and Rosario Granados. And today I'm going to share with you some of the work that I've been doing about the catalog of the Patricia Phelps de Cisneros donation that uh, came to UT in 2018. 
to the Blanton in 2018. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, this uh, tremendously generous gift came to the Blanton uh, as part of a, a bigger donation that uh, the Patricia Phelps de Cisneros collection uh, gave to uh, six museums, uh, the Museo de Arte de Lima in Peru, uh, Museo de Arte Reina Sofía in Madrid, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, the uh, Bronx Museum of the Arts uh, in New York too, uh, and uh, the Museo de Arte Moderno de Buenos Aires and uh, the Blanton. It's important to mention that uh, how big was this donation and how important uh, was for the field of Latin American art, uh, I would say worldwide. And here I have some examples of how was that covered by the media, by the press uh, when it was launched in 2018. And so the Patricia Ferdinand Cisneros collection, uh, just to give you some um, um, brief description about it, uh, is a collection founded by Patricia Ferdinand Cisneros and uh, her husband Gustavo Cisneros to Venezuelan collectors uh, that since the 70s, they are promoting scholarship, research, and preservation of Latin American art in Europe, Latin America, and the US. And uh, another important fact of this donation, uh, not only for all the museums in the world, but uh, more uh, importantly uh, for the Blanton and for UT uh, is that um, the Blanton and UT uh, have a long um, historical relationship with the field of Latin American studies. Uh, we have the Blanton collection, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Benson collection uh, um, at UT, uh, the Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies too, uh, and the Blanton Museum with uh, one of the largest um, collections of Latin American art uh, in the US. So this um, donation uh, comes to the museum uh, with the goal uh, of strengthening some uh, parts of the collection that weren't um, represented uh, in the Blanton collection. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so here just as a brief example, because this donation uh, is uh, um, a big donation of 58 artworks that came to the Blanton. Uh, I only uh, selected uh, some representative artworks uh, just to not overwhelm you with the set, with the with uh, 58 uh, different images. Um, so here in this slide, uh, I share with you um, the works that are from Venezuela, and I'm doing this uh, because. Um, the majority of the artworks of this donation are from Venezuela, and uh, the other ones are from Brazil, Mexico, Mexico uh, Colombia, Panama, uh, and Argentina. So uh, just to give you some idea about the curatorial approach uh, behind, behind um, this donation uh, is the fact that in the case of the Venezuelan artist, it's very interesting to see how uh, this donation itself interacts, uh, the, inter the interaction uh, of the artists are very interesting between them. For example, Jared, uh, uh, Jared Leifert, Mateo Manaure, and Diego are these pivotal figures uh, in the uh, Venezuelan art history. And uh, at, the same are, at the same time are um, creating um, um, we, we can create some ties between them as these pivotal figures with artists that are more uh, younger, like Alessandro Valteo Jaspet, Jose Gabriel Fernandez, Jaime Gili, Luis Molina Pantin, Ali Gonzalez, and many others that are part of the donation. Uh, not only um, in terms, in historical terms, but also, uh, or in influential terms, but also in the terms of uh, how this. Uh, three more important artists, Diego, Ger Lefert, and Man Mateo Manaure, they were teaching these other artists in, at some point and funding institutional um, education institutes uh, in Venezuela. So they were, uh, all of them were interacting. And uh, this is only interesting to see how collectors uh, create um, 
um, historical ties uh, through um, this donation. So that is very important. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so also just as an example, uh, here are artists that are not from Venezuela, but are part of the donation too. Uh, some from Mexico, Pia Camila and Mariana Castillo de Val, Quisqueya Enriquez from Cuba, but now she's working in uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Brazilian ones, Frida Baranek, Ivens Machado, Leda Catunda, and from Argentina, eh, Edgardo Rudnitsky. About um, these artworks in a specific, about the ones from Brazil, it is also interesting to see how uh, uh, the three of them, Leda Catunda, Ives Machado, and Frida Baranek, are part of the same uh, generation. Uh, the 80s generation in Brazilian art, a very important um, uh, moment in Brazilian art production, especially because it was um, happening just after the dictatorship in the process of transition to democracy. So it's very um, fascinating how this uh, collection is constructed and donated, donated uh, to the Blanton creating these ties. And uh, another important point is that uh, the Argentinian artist Edgardo Rudnitsky uh, is coming to the Blanton collection uh, with this work, which is a, which is a sound work. Uh, it's an installation, but it's mainly sound. Um, so, uh, in the, and in the Latin American art collection at the Blanton, that was a um, type of practice that was kind of underrepresented. Uh, so it's very important to uh, have this kind of works to uh, open the possibilities of research and study uh, about new practices of Latin American art. So next slide, please. So as part of the work of doing the catalog, um, I'm uh, writing catalog entries of each of these uh, 58 artworks, doing an essay, and um, of course, in the process of uh, writing these um, catalog entries is uh, fundamental, the research that we do uh, about the artworks that we are writing about. So, um, I choose uh, this work to focus my the, the last part of my presentation to tell you a story about how uh, are the intricacies of doing research about these specific objects. And I uh, choose this uh, work because, as you can say, as you can see uh, in the slide, it doesn't have uh, a date. So I was, um, when I was doing research and trying to find information about this artwork in a specific, I was kind of lost because it didn't have uh, a specific date. And um, so because of that, I, I uh, choose to tell you a little story about uh, how I ended up uh, having a clue about the exact date uh, or at least the period in which uh, this work was created. Uh, Gerd, um, Gerd Loifert uh, is a very, very important artist uh, in Venezuelan art history. He um, uh, came uh, to Venezuela in 1951. Uh, after the Second World War uh, happened in Europe, he was coming from Germany, who in that, that, in that time was Germany, now is Lithuania. And uh, when uh, he uh, came to Venezuela, uh, he started funding uh, art uh, institutions, uh, educational institutions, uh, setting also the kind of the basis uh, for the history of graphic arts in Venezuela. Uh, he was part of the uh, curatorial team in the Museum of Fine Arts in Caracas. Uh, he taught for several years in universities, art institutes. Uh, he designed um, many, many um, exhibition catalogs in different museums in Venezuela. So he's a very uh, important and pivotal figure. Uh, he was very prolific too, and when I was trying to uh, find some clue about this work, of course I was 
uh, doing research about the different periods of uh, his work. That is also uh, in a variety of medias, um, like installations, drawings, paintings, photographs, uh, and also this work, who is a, uh, which is a print on silk. And inside the um, um, body of work of this artist was kind of rare to see a print on silk. I couldn't find any other type of work like this, like this media, uh, in um, the body of work of this artist. So next slide, please. So when I was trying to figure out how to find something, I, of course, I went to the archives and I went to the archive uh, the international of the International Center for the Arts of the Americas at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And in the database of that archive, I had the idea of putting the words print and silk, only those two words. And uh, of course, I first I put the name of the artist, but I couldn't find anything. So at the end, I decided uh, to put um, the words that were um, kind of descriptive of this uh, artwork. So I ended up finding uh, this uh, wonderful page uh, of an uh, exhibition catalog of, uh, of an exhibition that was called La Mano, La Seda del Color, Estampa sobre Seda de Nueve Artistas Venezolanos, like it would be the hand, the silk and the color, prints on silk of nine uh, Venezuelan artist that was curated by, by Manuel Espinosa in 1978. And even though in this uh, specific page of the catalog, which is the only page of the catalog that is part of this archive, uh, is not mentioned the name of uh, Loifert. Uh, oh, it's there. Only Jared, yes. Uh, I, um, yes, he's mentioned it. I forgot that. Um, I was uh, thinking that, okay, maybe uh, this work was part of this exhibition, but this is the only page that is available uh, in the archive. Uh, but uh, the wonderful thing is that our fellowship comes from with uh, funding to do travel research. So I went uh, to um, my library in New York where the catalog was uh, held there. So next slide, please. And uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to see the real catalog in my hands and go pages through pages. Uh, sadly, um, uh, there is no, in the exhibition catalog, there is no information about each of the pieces exhibited uh, in the museum, in the exhibition. But the back cover of the catalog has uh, this beautiful image, which is super, super, super similar to the work of uh, Loifert. And of course, his name was there in the list of artists. And just as a brief uh, description of the exhibition, is an, this exhibition is, um, it was part of an initiative of a, a textile company in Venezuela in the 70s, uh, a company called Cobalto. And uh, inside the company, it was funded a workshop, Taller Cobalto, in which uh, Loifert was part of it. And uh, this is part, of course, of um, this uh, historical um, uh, promotion of uh, industries, uh, historical promotion that industries made about visual arts in Venezuela during the second half of the 20th century. Uh, but and here are some pages of the catalog, but any of the pages has uh, a picture of Loifert or an exact picture of the, um, of the artwork. So I was very like, I don't know, lost about it. Uh, next slide, please. I'm trying to find some more clues uh, with Flora and Rosario. We went to see uh, the original artwork uh, that is storage uh, in the museum and uh, is and at the left you can see the page of the catalog of the back cover and uh, there are uh, evident differences so now I'm thinking that I least, uh, at least I have uh, the clue of the period in which this work was done 
uh, but maybe this um, this work, the one that is part of the donation, is part of a series that the artist was doing, uh, or because it is a print on silk, maybe was intended to be uh, sold or wear as a garment. Uh, there are so many ideas that we can develop about this, but I just wanted to share this with you uh, as a way to show you um, what are the intricacies that we uh, follow uh, to find information and at the end uh, to produce uh, this uh, catalog. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, I just love your sleuthing and detective work and a heads up for any artists who might be viewing, please sign and date your works of art just to make it a little easier for the curators who are going to be researching um, your works in the, in the future. I, we are almost out of time, but if we have um, any burning questions, we would love to um, put them to the panel. I see that there haven't been any questions so far, but if there are any, I think it's just a fantastic presentation. Thank you, all three of you. Thank you for so generously sharing um, your time and your work with our audience and the fact that it's a kind of a, a recorded artifact um, of your Mellon Fellowship is, is really a gift, um, both to the museum and to um, new fellows who will be joining us um, in the fall. And just a reminder, if you would, um, my apologies, please, um, please check our website for updates on our next Mellon Fellow recruitment cycle with applications due um, in January. And if you'd like to show your support for the Blanton, become a member today at blantonmuseum.org forward slash membership. Sign up for our Blanton news at blantonmuseum.org forward slash subscribe to always be in the know about what's happening at the museum. And thanks again to everyone for joining us and hope to see you next year when we celebrate the new cohort of Mellon Fellows. Thank you so much, Fellows. You have some wonderful accolades and celebrations in the chat that I hope you are reading and enjoying. It was a really fantastic presentation. Thank you to all three of you for um, just being so prepared and um, joyful. Thank you.